Did you know a city can actually be a sanctuary for bees? Hey, this is Daniel Hartz with Sustainability Matters Today, a podcast where I showcase sustainability experts and discover their journeys. The aim of these conversations is to share ideas from leaders in the field on the financial benefits of adopting eco-friendly methodologies. Through these talks, I hope to uncover ways you as an individual can incorporate environmentally friendly practices into your daily life. In this episode, my guest is Camilla Goddard, founder and owner of Capital B, an urban beekeeping operation in London, England. Camilla keeps around 70 beehives for businesses and organizations around London, teaches beekeeping courses on the rooftop of a four-star luxury hotel, and finds homes for vulnerable bumblebees and honeybees. We talk about how Camilla got started in beekeeping. We go into the importance of bees for both the environment and humans, and why they play a crucial role in our ecosystem. And although Camilla recognizes the challenges bees are facing, she's hopeful they can adapt and flourish despite urbanization and climate change. You can learn more about Camilla and her work on her website, capitalb.co.uk. That's capital B-E-E dot co dot U-K. Let's jump in. I'm excited to be speaking with Camilla Goddard, owner of Capital B, a beekeeping operation based in South and Central London that produces and sells honey, runs courses, and keeps bees on behalf of other organizations such as schools, universities, and businesses. In doing so, Camilla serves as a spokesperson on the importance of bee welfare. Camilla, the purpose of this podcast is to ask sustainability experts like yourself about the importance of the work you're doing and to get advice on how bee welfare is not only important, but also cost effective for our society in the long run. So I'd like to ask about how you got started in this field, why bees are so critical, what beekeeping accomplishes, uh, and your suggestions for simple and sustainable things people listening to this podcast can do today to support bees and the bee population. How does that okay. sound? That's great. Well, thank you, Daniel, for having me on. I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. Thank you. Great. I'm very, very delighted that you're here as well. Um, and I'd love to hear a bit before we dive into all the kind of interesting um, specifics of what you do. I'd love to hear more about uh, your background and you know, how you got started in, in beekeeping. Uh, well, I, I used to work in the arts uh, for about 10 years. Um, and then I noticed that all my projects were becoming kind of environmental because uh, I was just interested in how things could be sustainable, even mm. in, you know, when you're doing sculptures and outdoor pieces and stuff like that, how it would fit in with the environment. Um, and then I just noticed that I was wanting to do green walls and stuff like that. And at the same time, um, I, I was really interested in gardening. I had an allotment. I was trying to grow organically. Um, and a friend of mine uh, said, why don't we buy a wood together? And we bought a wood. Um, <laughs> wow. I didn't know uh, you could do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah uh, I think it's called woodlands.co.uk uh, or something. You can, you can buy wood. Okay. And yeah. So uh, we ended up getting this sort of amazing like hornbeam wood. It's, only a little small word, and um, I I was thinking that I'd like to um, do like uh, forging and metalwork and have a little place there where I could, you know, make gates and stuff like that and decorative ironwork. Um, wow. uh, <laughs> That's cool. Uh, so, yeah. So uh, and I thought, well, I won't disturb anybody there, but you know, maybe the birds will be upset. But anyway, I, I realized that it was quite a dangerous pursuit after a couple of uh, trips to A&E, you know. <laughs> oh, oh so, uh, so I thought that's not going to work. But actually, it was just lovely visiting the woods and just being there. And, mm. you know, uh, we make shelters and stuff. And then um, uh, she bought a beehive and I was terrified. I just thought that's crazy. But uh <laughs> And I hadn't previously had any interest in insects at all, really. Um, right. And then I just sort of suddenly got into it. And um, I just thought, my God, this is just amazing. There's so, so much to learn. They're so complex. They're so clever. They have this mm. whole society. And they make this incredible honey. And when you open up a hive, you can literally smell what's flowering. I mean, you know, and I wow. just got deeper into it. And then... 
I was still living in London, so I just thought, well, maybe I could just keep them in London. And at that time, that's like, you know, about God, 15 years ago, um, you know, people were scared of the idea of having bees. But fortunately, a church had some spare land and they said, well, without any question, they just said, and I'm so pleased that the, the vicar, this amazing lady did at the time, um, she said, um, yeah, well, that'd be great. Um, why don't you have bees here? Um, and we'd love to have them. And then I started keeping them there. And then I started keeping them in parks. And then the council said, would you mind collecting swarms for us? And then a community garden said, would you like to teach? And, you know, it, eventually I just sort of started to take over my life. And I thought, you know what, I care more about this than I do. I feel like I've done a lot of work in the arts. And actually, you know, I feel my heart is more in this direction now. So uh, that's what happened. And I did have a spiritual experience as well, which was quite good. Uh, okay, you want to hear that? that always helps. I'd love to. <laughs> that sounds very interesting. <laughs> Well, I, I was in the garden and I was having, I was sitting on a deck chair with a friend. A friend, we were chatting, having a cup of tea in the garden, and I had both hands on each side of the deck chair where the handles are, and a honeybee landed on one hand, and a bumblebee landed on the other one. Uh, Simultaneously. Yes. And uh, I thought, oh my goodness, maybe that's a sign that I should get into beekeeping. This is kind of the way I'm going. And then, wow. and then I, I realized later on that that actually wasn't the message. What it was is that you're going to do beekeeping with honey, honeybees, and then you're going to be doing bumblebee rescue with bumblebees, which happened later on when people had problems with bumblebees if they're in their gardens and stuff, and they're landscaping or building or something. Yeah. And I started doing relocating bumblebees. So, yeah, it's, it's, those were the things that kind of came together, really. Wow. And um, if we fast forward 15 years from when you started, how many hives do you manage now? Uh, well, actually, this spring, because of the, it goes up and down, really, uh, because depending on the weather in each year, uh, sometimes you have, have a really good year and you can really expand colonies. So mm. now I'd say I'm getting up to about 70 because you, this last weekend has been, was so, last couple of weeks has been so warm that a lot yeah. of colonies have been dividing. Um, so, you know, you end up with lots and lots of little small nucleus colonies to get going and build up. So it's been, it's been in some ways, it's been quite very early spring for bees. Yeah, I've noticed that as well. Mm. Um, just been a very warm year in general. Well, that sounds like a very interesting start, and it seems that it just sort of happened naturally. Uh, you kind of just yeah. fell into it almost. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was always interested in the environment. I was brought up on a farm, and it's kind of brought that kind of like, I feel like I'm sort of farming in the city in a funny way. Yeah, which is very cool. And I'd love to dig into that a bit more um, a bit later. And I, I think it's really important for, for our audience to hear about why bees are so crucial for the environment. Um, and yeah. I'm sure you've been seeing it more than yeah, most of us have really that yeah. all these headlines in the news about the bee population declining. So, yeah. um, I think it'd, it'd be great to understand why that's so significant and yeah. why we should be so concerned. Yeah, I mean, when you're a beekeeper, you're looking after colonies, um, and when they have problems, you're trying to deal with them. But in the wild, um, you know, there are think the things like varroa mite, uh, which is a new thing in the last ten years which is um, like a tiny mite which gets into the colony um, and it um, feeds on the larva so that the bees don't develop properly and it can undermine the whole strength of a colony. Um, and it, that's spread all over Europe now and most colonies at different degrees have it. So you're trying to keep that to a low level in the colony so it will survive. But there's only mm -hmm. got pest problems like that. There's so much change going on with the climate as well you know that they're adapting all the time to these sorts of variables and then on top of that um, you've got insecticides so even in London I will have incidents of insecticide poisoning in beehives um, so wow. people the thing about insecticides is people can spray something in their garden and they don't realize that that might be affecting a honeybee colony three miles away 
because they travel three miles around their hive. So the, even the beekeeper won't know where they're going and picking it up. So right. people got to realize that what they're doing is connecting, you know, it has a knock on effect. Um, so it's not just happening in their garden. They can be affecting bee colonies three miles away by their, mm. by using insecticides. So, and why they're really important bees Well, two, two things I'd say, I, you know, they, they have a role in pollination, which is really important whereby they're enabling plants to make seeds. So a huge role in our ecosystem. But but mm-hmm. also, you know, when people say, oh, it's you know, it's really important that we keep bees because, you know, for us, actually just as another species, you know, they have every right to be here as much as we do. And, you know, we yeah. have this attitude that everything should serve us. Well, actually, you know, they were here before us, you know. So, mm. um I feel that quite strongly when people say, oh, it's, you know, we must keep them going so that we've got, we, you know, food to eat for ourselves and all that, you know. Um, yeah. It's just respecting everything, even if it doesn't serve our purposes. Yeah, at least not directly or necessarily specifically for us. Yes. You know. um, it's a really good point. And, you know, I guess that's the natural kind of way that humans are is very we're very focused on ourselves and Mm. how things can serve us as you say and Mm. if bees are declining you know obviously we can you know discuss that it's bad because bees were here first Mm. Um, but if we're to really sound the alarm and have people understand that the bee population declining is bad for humans Mm. as well as for bees and the rest of the environment why should people be concerned well the diet first of all all the fruit and vegetables that we eat, most of them um, are pollinated by bees. So, you mm-hmm. know, every, all the sort of oranges, broccoli, all these different things that people eat. Um, you know, there's only a few things that are wind pollinated, like wheat, you know, popcorn, those sorts of things. So the mm-hmm. diet would be totally messed up, um, you know. And if things continue, um, you know, I I, I, I do notice though there has been a massive sea change in attitude uh, over the time that I've been keeping bees. Where first of all it's hard to find sites, then people were saying yep. have a free site, and then they're saying you know we will pay you to look after bees for us. I mean that's that's huge change in London over the last ten years. Um, yeah. So I do I, I think there's a lot of positivity as well. It's not just all bad news. I mean so there's a thousand thousand new beekeepers in London. You know at least. Apparently. Brilliant. So that's uh, well, that's very good news. Um, and so you you mentioned that there are organizations and you know companies that are paying you to keep bees for them. Oh yeah. Um, why are they interested in that? What's their motivation behind that? There's well, there's two things really. Um, uh, I do a lot of sort of schools, universities, that kind of thing, and that's really mm-hmm. around education. Um, though they may have like a green strategy as part of the school or they might have solar panels they might be trying to kind of encourage kids to think about those sorts of things but it's usually things like education uh, sustainability um, is a big one for larger organizations so like um, you know I do the Quakers and keeping bees as part of a whole raft of things that they do um, Mm. trying to um, put back uh, into the environment so you know I've Notice those seem to be the main things. And also, I, I notice they do stuff with some organizations, do staff training, and it's kind of like um, something that they can all do and they feel positive about doing. And that if I come along and look inside a hive and they feel, you know, kind of brings people together, brings the organization together, makes them feel like they're doing something positive as well beyond what their, their own work. So, yeah. so lots of different kind of impacts, really. Um, yeah. Some some of them use like hotels. They use the honey for VIP stuff. Um, okay. You know, so it kind of it sort of develops over time, and people kind of get what different things out of it, really. But it's mostly education and sustainability. Hmm. Makes sense. I think that's yeah really important for people to learn how it how it all works. I I was discussing in in a previous episode. Um, there's so many kids in our society now who don't have any idea mm. where food comes from <laughs> yeah absolutely um, or what it looks like yeah. uh, and i'm sure that goes for honey as well and to think oh, you know, honey comes from 
you know, the whole process of honey, how where honey comes from is quite complex and much more probably different than I I would imagine many kids who have no idea. Um, it's probably very different than what they think. Yeah, I mean, I I teach in four or five primary schools, um, and that's kind of more on the radar in education, uh, bees and you know concern for the bees. Um, but what's quite interesting is that behaviour is learned actually. So mm. if I'm doing a school group and the teachers are afraid of bees or give off that vibe, um, the kids will pick that up. But if they haven't huh. learnt that, <laughs> um, yeah. they react differently. So I had I was really shocked actually. One day I was doing a school group and um, this girl came forward and wanted to look in the hive, and then she just looked in the hive and said, "Come to me, my lovelies." And I <laughs> <laughs> and I just completely she had no fear at all because she hadn't learnt it. She yeah. hadn't learned, nobody told her that she'd be should be frightened of it or something. So, you wow. know, she was very not, completely just just went in there, looked in as if they were like, you know, little kittens or something. And and it was it was amazing, actually. And I thought, yeah, good for you, actually. And you're right. That's, <laughs> that is, if you approach, <laughs> if you approach with kind of uh, gentleness and kindness, you, they will respond to that. You know, whereas if you're kind of all tense and you're to jogging the frames around, you know, they pick yeah. that up, too. So. You know, if you're relaxed around them and slow and work at their pace, then they'll be fine, you know, usually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Animals are, animals really pick up on those kind of, that energy that people give off. Yeah. You know, so I'm sure. Yeah. 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 Um, and speaking of teaching, part of what you do is um, you have beekeeping courses on the top, uh, on the rooftop of the St. Ermans Hotel in central London. Yeah. We, there's a, there's, a, there's a terrace area where you can, so people that are staying at the hotel, it's a kind of glass thing and you can see uh, the bees coming and going. Uh, yeah. And then I'll take groups out um, if they want to have it, like we do a taster session. So they'll um, go along, learn about bee society and the equipment, how to get started. And then we'll have a look in a hive just so people can get used to it practically I think some people learn in different ways and sometimes people like to sort of physically kind of see how things go together and sort of um, get a more hands-on experience so it's sort of quite good and we'll have a little co- look at a little colony so that they get used to it and feel comfortable you know but mm. if people don't know what to expect they don't know the behavior of the bees how they're going to be so you know I think that's quite a good way of really introducing people yeah it sounds absolutely fascinating and it's amazing that you can actually experience something like that you know for someone who's not used to bees that they can experience something like that right in the middle of a big and busy city like london oh, yeah. uh, it's so cool that it's right in the middle of it yeah um, but there, there's something like three hundred fifty thousand honeybees living on that terrace yeah so each colony can go up to so colonies go up and down according to the time of year so you uh-huh. know in the winter it might be a few thousands by the end of sort of by the end of the winter january february time and then as they expand, then they can go up to about 40-odd thousand um, in the oh, height wow. of the summer. So it's sort of constantly sort of fluctuating. And when you're looking after bees, you're working with them around the year, whether you're sort of stacking up the hive when they're filling it up with honey or you're trying to reduce it down so that they're all together during the winter to keep warm. Uh, so you're working mm. with them and you're watching the weather. It's a bit like gardening, actually, because you're, you're watching the weather all the time. Um because that will dictate how you work with them um, and how they're going to manage. Somebody said to me today, I was doing a, a talk somewhere today, and, you know, this is an adult, and, you know, a lot of people do ask this question, is what's honey for anyway, uh, for the bees? Hmm. <laughs> and um, it's actually is to help them get through winter, but also if it rains throughout June, they'll eat up all the honey. So, you know, they have to, it's like, that's why when you take honey off, you've got to make sure, they got plenty as a it's their security really for difficult times. So. so it really is for a rainy day. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, they don't go out if wow. it's raining. Well, they don't want. They don't like to go out when it's raining. If they get caught out in the rain, you know that can be really bad news for them. Yeah, that's. I'm sure their wings don't really like the. No. The wet. No, 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 no. Yeah, makes sense. And so, um. Uh, you mentioned what what you teach, um, and it's really just getting people comfortable with it. Um, I guess what what would what do you hope your 
students or the people who join this course, what do you hope they take away and potentially do once they're done? Yeah, um, it's funny actually that a lot of people go in courses, it's like a birthday present or yeah, a Christmas present or something. It's something that they've kind of meant to do for themselves for a long time but haven't got around to. Uh, somebody yeah. else has sort of stepped in. Um, or you get people that are have got a fear of bees and are trying to get over it. You get people that come on courses for that, interestingly. Um, and then you get other people that are that have got um, an idea that they want to move out of London and you know be self sufficient and live in the country and grow their own food. And so they go on a beekeeping course and then they go on a chicken keeping course. So it's, <laughs> it's interesting the mix that you get. And there's people that are coming up to retire. But also, I'm surprised it's such a mixture nowadays. When I started beekeeping, it was mostly guys. Now it's it's actually it's about two thirds women and a lot of younger people. So it's sort of you know it's changed a lot. Um, and that's in London. I don't know if that's true for the rest of the country, but certainly in London, it's a really diverse mix actually, which is great. That's really cool. That's very interesting. Yeah. Part of what you do, it sounds like, is what's called urban beekeeping, uh, and that's where you're keeping bees in yeah. in the city as opposed to out in the country. And so yeah. um, is urban beekeeping an important part of the restoration of the bee population? Well, I'd say London is, a, and in cities, it's a different situation in some ways because it's kind of like a sanctuary because um, there's less crop spraying and that kind of thing. Um, so they're not having to deal with the sort of insecticides they might do in the country. Um, but also, um, you're going to get a different type of honey as well. So Lon mm. London honey, they're, what's so important about London is that there's so many lime trees planted along the streets. Those lime trees are real lifesaver. Some people call them linden trees. They're these big trees that can cope with pollution, actually. Um, that are all over central London. Trees are really mm. important for bees. People kind of think it's all about lavenders and flat, sort of bushes and flowers, but actually, trees really are the sort of lifeblood of you know these bee populations. Um, and it makes a fantastic kind of, sort of citrusy sort of honey. Um, but they don't see London. If you're a bee, you don't see London as a city. You just see it's a different type of landscape. And you're look yeah. you're looking at plants. Uh, like, you know, palm trees and, you know, all different, you know, not native plants, but all sorts. Um, you're looking at the ones with the, the highest sugar contents in the nectar. So they're just selecting what they think is the best. Um, and I, I um, occasionally get asked by, uh, I've got University of London actually was one of them that asked, um, can you get the honey analyzed to see where the bees are going? Um, so we kind of come back with a kind of a whole list of Latin names, you know, from this lab, and you work it out, and basically it's like a cocktail, really, that they're mixing up. Um, and one of them, you know, I hadn't really been aware of is a tree called Tree of Heaven, which they love in London. They go to that, and they they're going along the railway networks, and they're picking up on brambles. Oh, wow. um, you know, they're going to allotments. Um, you know, you can see that just by what's coming up in terms of where they're going. So it's really interesting because you can't really ask them, but you can you can actually send it off and get yeah. it analysed. Um, and that means that when I tell people what to plant for bees, I can base it on what I know they're visiting um, rather than mm. just conjecture about it. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. As far as um, the diversity of what the bees are eating or gathering, what the trees that they're visiting and plants as well, St. Ermans has a bee and bee hotel, uh, which I love that name. <laughs> Uh, and it's it basically 20 large hexagonal shelves, yeah. um, which just are on a wall on the roof of the hotel. Yeah. Um, and if you look at, at the photo of this of this shelf, there's a bunch of things inside each one of those shelves. It's like twigs and yeah. you know all, all sorts of dried stuff. Yeah. Um, so what exactly is a bee hotel? And yeah. How does it work? Yeah. So so what that's for is actually aimed at. So, solitary bees. So honeybees live in hives. Uh, bum, bumblebees, mm -hmm. well, it depends on the type, but most of them are kind of social and they um, live under the ground or under paving slabs. Some of them, like tree bumblebees, sort of get into people's roofs, actually. Um, but um, solitary bees 
uh, they have a sort of very tiny little life cycle, um, and they they like to lay eggs uh, in stalks. So when you go to a a garden centre, you'll see a lot of these sort of um, bamboo canes cut in half. Um, and what those mm-hmm. are for are for things like leaf cutter bees um, or um, masonry bees, those sorts of things, which which like those as a habitat. Um, so what's happening there at St. Irma's is just like a whole load of different types of habitats and also rolled up um, uh, cardboard um, is a home for things like lace wings. Um, so you can make it for different types of insects depending on what you're trying to attract. Um, but sort of right. making holes in wood as well is another thing that leaf cutter bees like. Um, so they like tiny, tiny little holes. If you want to encourage them into your garden, uh, different sizes of canes as well. So vary the type. And it takes a while for them to find it. And it needs to be up in a kind of head level, sunny sort of spot and attached to a wall or something like that. So it's got a solid back to it, not just um, hanging. Mm. Uh, so oh, it might take a year or two for them to find it. And then once they get going, you know, they they get established. But actually, I had a call from somebody this week who thought they had a swarm of bees. Um, but in fact, it was um, on an allotment. They'd put up one of these um, bug hotel type things. And it's attracted so many solitary, uh, tiny little solitary bees that don't, they don't sting. They're just tiny little things um, that she thought it was actually a swarm. And she'd had it there for, for a year wow. or so and hadn't noticed. And then sort of in this hot weather, they were all sort of, you know, active. Well, it's amazing that there were so many. She thought it was a swarm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Um, you, you mentioned uh, the leaf cutter and masonry bees. A previous guest, um, Elena Hartz, uh, she mentioned that those bees are almost twice as effective at pollinating as honey bees. Oh. I was wondering, um, what is the value of bee diversity? Well, we've got, I think it's over over a couple of hundred types of bees in the UK. Mm-hmm. Um, different bees like different plants. So they all have their own little system going. So if you look in a garden at all different flowers, you'll notice that like, you know, red tail bumblebees are on chives or another type is on another type of flower. It depends sort of what, what's adapted for them and what they're looking for at that particular time. So it's a very complex system. And if anything sort of dies out within that system, it has a knock-on effect to the plants that it's engaged with. So, you know, it's about seeing the thing holistically that we need all of these different types of pollinators. I mean, even wasps are pollinate. I mean, I'm, I'm not keen on wasps because they attack bees, but, um, you know, they all have their role. Um, and it's, yeah. you know, important to try and sustain them and create habitats for them all. You know, if, if people want to help bees, they don't have to become a beekeeper. Um, just planting for a variety of types of bees, whether it's foxgloves for bumblebees or crocus in the spring to help bees find pollen to feed their larva. You know, mm-hmm. those sorts of things are, are just as important because we need the forage for them. There's no point just keeping lots of bees everywhere. You need to have plenty of forage for them so that it can be sustainable for all of us. Yeah. Going back to what we were talking about earlier with the importance of bees and uh, potentially the declining bee population, first of all, are you seeing any sort of declines in bee population in your day to day? Well, I'm seeing insecticide poisoning, um, and that seems to be continuing. So um, that is a real concern for me. Um, and there isn't so far, um, although there's, there's things you can do to get rid of the varroa mite uh, in colonies, that's sort of carrying on. Bees haven't really found a way of getting rid of it completely yet on their own. Mm. Um, so those kind of things are a threat. And the one thing that is coming is Asian hornets. They're already in the UK, apparently, and they will knock out a colony. Um, they're they're in, in France and Spain, and they will find colonies. They have scouts that find colonies, and then all the hornet colony will come, and they they can wipe out um, a honeybee colony um, in an hour or so, you know. And wow. And that's, that's one, you know, that's coming. So, you know, they're just having quite a tough time at the moment. So many things sort of, seem to be lining up, making it hard for them. 
Um, yeah. So, but I am hopeful just because there's much more um, support for for bees, um, and people are much more aware of their impact on them. So I'm, you know, I'm fingers crossed, hopeful. Um, and you know, all the people that are learning about beekeeping now will be teaching you know, their children or their friends, you know, in the future. So it's much more expertise around than there was, you know, 10 years ago. Um, so I feel hopeful. Yeah, that's great. I think that's the most important thing is that optimism. And uh, mm-hmm. as long as, you know, people are paying attention and mindful of what what they're doing on a day-to-day basis, I would imagine that there really is reason to be hopeful. And um, as you say, I mean, the over the last 15 years, you've really seen a change in how people are uh, yeah. thinking I mean, about bees. Friend, Friends of the Earth did a really brilliant campaign, actually, to help bees. And they had a whole plants list um, and they did a lot of stuff in schools and they raised awareness. And it's that kind of thing that really helps, actually. It changes public opinion um, and it helps to support uh, what we're trying to do is keep bees going, really. Yeah, well, that's that's fantastic. And um, you you mentioned this earlier, but what aside from planting um for bees in in your garden, what can people do on a day to day basis to encourage bee populations and to keep bees healthy? So try to avoid um products in your garden. It's just it's not just farmers using insecticides. Just that some of the products you might think are kind of you know normal like garden sprays and stuff like that. They might contain these sort of neonicotinoids. So just research um, about what could um, affect in the insect population in your area before you sort of, you know, knee jerk start using products um, when you're not sure the actual impact they're going to have. Because um, I'm sure people don't realise what, you know, if they are, you know, poisoning bees, they may not mean to. It's just that um, it's not aware of uh, the chemicals they're dealing with. Um, mm. That kind of thing. Trying to keep your hedgerows, um, or even in London, hedges, um, you know, provide like privet actually has sort of nectaries um, in the plant, which provides nectar uh, for bees. Um, so it's funny that things like like that. Um, trying to grow, grow trees that are bee friendly, looking at it as sort of a whole approach, and you know. There will be things like occasionally in London, there's more beekeepers, there'll be swarms. Um, you know, if you see a swarm in your area, call the British Beekeeping Association and, and somebody will pop down and pick it up and give it a home. You know, yeah. so instead of them being something that's scary, I mean, swarms are not, people think that swarms are like a bee movie thing, but um, <laughs> they're, they're not. Um, they, they don't want to sting anybody. They're just actually quite vulnerable because they're looking for a new home somewhere and they're just hanging waiting for the scouts to tell them where to go um and particularly in london you know it's quite a tough environment to find a new home if you're a bee uh so they end up going to sort of chimney pots and things like that but if you can ring up uh, a local beekeeper and get them to pop down and pick them up and give them a home that'd be great yeah um, that kind of thing you know if you can buy local honey that all helps um you know support local beekeepers and that sort of thing but mm-hmm. uh, planting is really important you know uh, that's really really key. And do you um you mentioned buying local honey? Do you sell the honey that you have? Um yeah, I do broccoli and Greenwich honey, um and that goes through local delis in the area uh, and grocers that sort of thing. It's only between really July and October um, when they sort of produce the surplus and they start mm-hmm. sealing it towards sort of midsummer. Um so yeah yeah. I'm sure it's delicious. I'd love to try some of that. <laughs> yeah. uh, actually, well, you get granite honey is nice because you have at the end of the season, it's, it's chestnut honey. It's quite dark and it's sort mm. of like caramel, barley sugar sort of flavours. It's, sort of, it's not that sweet. It's just like really rich and deep. Um, but London honey in general starts off quite light in the spring, sort of floral and citrusy. And then as the year goes on, it gets darker and richer and sort of less sweet, more kind of caramels. But um, that's in general, but it varies regionally. Wow. Mm-hmm. But each hive is making different decisions as a society. So honey in one hive next to another one might taste different because they've made through, they use things like the waggle dance. They have a little yeah. dance, dance that they do inside the hive on the surface of the frame, which indicates to the other bees um, 
the best direction to go in, where they can find a good source of nectar. Um, so that so it means that within the hive and according to the season, you might have different types of honey, different flavors, and adjacent hives can taste completely different. So you know, wow. they're like a society trying to work out what's best, you know, for their survival. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. And it's interesting to hear that the color and taste of the honey changes depending on the time of year. Yeah, and what's flowering, you know. And yeah. the temperature outside, so they start flying if it's above 10 degrees. But as, as the temperature goes up, flowers start to release nectar. That's why last weekend, they, you know, they were, all bees across London were going crazy, filling up hives. I mean, I've never seen honey so early in the year as this. Um, mm. And I've been keeping bees for about 15 years, so you know it's an extraordinary spring. But it's it's great for some hives because if a weak hive, it's a good nectar flow. You know, it really boosts them up and they're really motivated, and it can turn them around. You know, from having a hard time to to feeling really positive. It's almost like you can sense the mood change. You know, when you open yeah. up a, when you open up a hive, you know what mood they're in because of the way that they sound. Well, they may not do anything. They may not make much sound at all, and that's good. But sometimes they, they're actually on a really warm day and things are going well. You can hear them humming. You can feel that sort of excitement. And they're doing these little, little dances, showing each other what to do. Um, and, you know, all shaking and dancing around. And that's because they're excited. There's even a dance called the joy dance, which is just like a little shake, you know, <laughs> when things are going well. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> How cool is that? Yeah, no, it's amazing. Yeah. Well, um, do you have any a book or two that you could recommend about bees or beekeeping? Yeah, um, well, there's lots of books. There's lots of books like Ted Hughes' Guide to Bees and Honey is a classic. Um, if you're interested in bee behavior and bee society, um, which is really complex and amazing, uh, there's a book called The Honey Bee Democracy, which is pretty incredible. Um, which sort of talks about the different types of dances that they do. Um, and then there's a lot of books that come out recently um, sort of about honey and how to cook with honey, um, which are really fantastic, actually, uh, taking a lot of inspiration from Middle Eastern cuisine, actually. Right. Um, so it depends what you're into. And there's certainly loads more books on beekeeping now um, over the last 10 years. There's been a huge sort of interest in it. And it's often, you know, even within gardening books, there's a section on how to keep bees as well and that sort of thing. So shop around and, you know, modern books are best for beekeeping, really, in some ways, because uh, they're dealing with modern problems. So Varroa, yeah. Varroa might didn't exist, you know, 10 years ago or before that. So, um, you know, if you want to keep bees, it's that. But, you know, some of the old books are amazing. They're really beautifully illustrated and, you know, show how people used to keep bees. And I like to look at the old books too. But, you know, for just, just you know, practically keeping bees, modern ones with lots of illustrations are good, so you know what to look for. Well, thank you for that. And uh, finally, where can people find you and learn more about what you're doing? Uh, so I've got a website called Capital B. Uh, .co.uk. Uh, you can always get through to me that way. Um, just drop me a line. And, um, you know, questions, I'm always happy to answer questions. Excellent. Cool. And um, when is that ne next uh, beekeeping course at the St. Irmans Hotel? And how can people book if they're interested? Um, so, yeah, they're online. Um, they look at St. Irmans website. Um, yep. I think there's a page which tells you upcoming beekeeping courses. Um, or um, if they're booked up, um, there's a waiting list too to go on. You know, if they rate, sometimes I'll arrange extra courses as well to give me a shout. So, um, Great. yeah, just go to the to Irma's website and ask that sort of app with. Excellent. Great. Well, Camilla, thank you so much for your time. Um, this was really, really enlightening and uh, very interesting to hear about uh, bees and how you got started in it. Thank you. Um, and all the different things that they, they can do. Oh, best of luck with your work. It's really great what you're doing. Much appreciated. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to Episode 3 of Sustainability Matters Today. You can find links to the books Camilla mentioned and the beekeeping courses at the St. Ermans Hotel London in the show notes, which you can see on my website, sustainabilitymatters.today. If you enjoyed this or any other SMT episodes, I'd really appreciate if you could take the time to give a five-star review. 
please subscribe to the podcast to be the first to know about new episodes. Talk to you soon.